All right, so I don't think we need to do introduction or anything like that. Everybody knows um, James Barrow, assistant professor. Uh, there you go. All right, so we're going to go through the objectives really quick. Um, first thing we're going to do is identify myths about obesity and weight loss, and uh, we're going to play a little game. Y'all can all vote. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about the epidemiology. I think Dr. Mighty went into that at length last week, so we're not going to do that again. Um, talk about an, uh, medical complications associated with obesity. We're going to talk about the gut hormones. Probably this is some probably some things y'all have never heard of. I hadn't heard of until I started looking at this. Uh, we're going to discuss basic nutritional concepts. I think we got three days of nutrition. And what are they doing in medical school now for y'all's nutrition? Uh, they have a web-based class. Oh, it's even better now. Web-based. Perfect. So I'm sure they're putting lots of effort into that. Oh, yeah. What do y'all think? Wikipedia and everything. What? <laughs> <laughs> point made, point made. <laughs> That's what Austin's like most medical students. Austin's a lazy player. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, moving along. <laughs> We're going to formulate a uh, systematic approach to initial assessment of an obese patient. We're going to talk about creating a diet and exercise plan. Then we're going to talk about uh, indications for medications and surgery at the end. All right. So this is, we have a, a, a role as physicians to dispel some of this, these myths. And if you're not educated, then you can't do that. So you're going to have patients show up to your office asking about all kinds of things. This three-day diet is a, they tell you exactly what to eat for three days. It's like 800 calories one day, 1,100 the next day, and 900 calories. And one of your days out of your 800 calories, it's like eat a bowl of ice cream. And that's the diet. And so these diets are... There's no uh, medical evidence to support any of this. And everybody's heard all these cleanses. They have this Bragg Organic. There's a ton of them. There's one where you mix like cayenne with water and all this. And they're supposed to cleanse you. And uh, there's no evidence to support that. They have these supplements. This is probably the biggest money waste that patients uh, uh, experience or going to GNC or Walmart or any of the places you look on the, on the uh, shelves. And they have all these supplements that uh, costs a lot of money. A bottle, a bottle of hydroxy cuts like 20 or 30 bucks and they'll, they'll buy this month after month. And uh, I think the important thing to remember is if there's some kind of miracle drug for weight loss, it's not going to be found in GNC. It's going to cost $200 and you're going to have to get a prescription for it. Okay? So I try to, I, I basically tell patients that all these things, they're all a waste of money. And so I would not encourage that. This thing is crazy right here. This is a new diet. This is a tongue patch. You actually go to a doctor and they sew this patch on your tongue so you cannot eat. And this is real. I mean, and people do this. And so it, it, it hurts to eat. It doesn't make you want to eat. It, it's rough. You can't, you can't taste the food. It's all kind of, I don't know. I don't know what it does. <laughs> yes, you can, I do that in my clinic. <laughs> Are, are you wanting a tongue patch or something? <laughs> so another, unfortunately, our patients are edu educate themselves with TV and Wikipedia, as uh, Brandy pointed out. So this is Dr. Oz. He got in trouble recently for making these, these claims. Let's see. that harms consumers. I encourage a nation searching for answers to their health woes. We often address weight loss because, as you all mentioned, it affects about two-thirds of the population. If the only message I gave was to eat less and move more, which is the most important thing people need to do, we wouldn't be very effectively tackling this complex challenge because viewers know these tips and they still struggle. So we search for tools and crutches for short-term support so people can jumpstart their programs. We use the alternative solutions often commonly used in countries, other parts of the world, like in the Ayurvedic tradition and 
uh, subcontinent of India, traditional Chinese medicine. We feature cleanses and new diet programs by promising authors. Now, many of these are controversial, as are the supplements that we research and profile. I would rather have a conversation of this material on my stage than in back alleys. I don't get why you need to say this stuff because you know it's not true. So why, when you have this so amazing... So you get the point. She goes on and on and, and, and... And this amazing ability to communicate, why would you cheapen your show? I actually do personally believe in the, in the items that I talk about in the show. I, I passionately study them. Uh, I recognize passionately that oftentimes them. they don't have the sure scientific muster. Lots of research. And so the point of all that is, is we have a powerful platform as physicians to dispel or um, encourage our patients to do the right thing. And, and uh, encouraging weird diets and tongue patches. This is a physician that was doing these tongue patches. And uh, supplements and all these things, that's probably not the best approach. All right, so we're gonna play the game here. Just raise your hand if you think it's a fact or fiction, okay? So this is based off like your Lose It app. If you do your Lose It app or your uh, My Fitness Pal, it tells you you can, I ran three miles, you type in three miles, uh, the pace, and it tells you how many calories you earn for the day. Okay, and this is based off of a formula. So walking one mile per day, so cutting your calories by 100 over uh, a long period of time, uh, five years, you'll lose 50 pounds. Y'all think that's fact or fiction? Raise your hand if you think it's a fact. Oh, this one's too easy. All right, so that's false, okay? It's based off this, this energy balance uh, formula that they came up with uh, that a pound of fat is 3,500 calories. And so uh, to change the energy, you decrease the energy balance and uh, over time and you'll get this sustained predictable weight loss and that's not true okay actually you, you'll only lose about 10 pounds if you if you walk one mile a day for five years all right shakes and other meal replacements promote greater weight loss I think that's fact or fiction raise your hand if you think it's a fact oh you're all wrong it's a fact okay oh except I'm sorry I didn't acknowledge that you were right so that's a fact. And so that's something you can incorporate into your um, counseling of patients. But to, for, meal replacements, for meal replacements to be uh, effective, they have to replace two meals a day. So you can't just do like a protein shake in the morning and then eat, eat regular food. You need to replace two meals a day. And some of these diet programs like uh, Medifast and some of these other ones, um, they do meal replacements all through the morning and they give you like guidelines of what to eat at night. And these are very successful because uh, they're structured. All right, setting realistic weight loss goals is important because otherwise patients will become frustrated and lose less weight. I think that's a fact or fiction? It's important to set good weight loss goals, right? Fiction, okay? That's not true. So they've actually done studies where they, they looked at this and it, it is not true. So if a patient comes in and they tell you wanna, they wanna lose 100 pounds, don't discourage them, that's good. Tell them we're gonna lose 100 pounds and set that goal and, make, and let that be their goal. It's not gonna affect their, uh, their success. All right, slow, gradual weight loss is associated with better long-term outcomes. So you always hear people say, um, you don't wanna lose a whole bunch of weight real fast because that's unhealthy and you'll just gain it back. So y'all think that's fact or fiction? You think it's a fact? Is better long-term? What do y'all think? Fact, everybody thinks it's fact? Does anybody think it's fiction. fiction? Fiction? Okay, let's see. It's fiction, okay? So that's not true either, all right? So it's okay if a patient loses 20 pounds if they do the Atkins diet and lose 20 pounds right off the bat. That's okay. That's not going to affect their long-term uh, success either. So... They're not more likely to rebound? Nope. That's, that's, a, that's why that, that's a myth. And so you can counsel patients that, you know, any weight loss is going to be good. It doesn't matter if it's fast or slow. The, the goal is the goal at the end. This is my favorite. This is rather than New England Journal of Medicine, okay? So you'll, hit, you'll hear this every once in a while. Patients say, well, I have sex every day and that burns like 100 to 300 calories. Let's get into it. No comment. So this is really depressing. So what do y'all think? Fact or fiction? Y'all think it's at least 100 calories, one round of sex? Be careful when you answer because it might say something about you too. 
So it's fiction, okay? So what do y'all think of, of a bout of sexual activity? How many calories does that burn? You're close. It does depend on. So Mar Mario, since you since you brought that up, what do you? What's the average sexual encounter from start to finish? <laughs> okay, Mar Mario says it's a minute. <laughs> Anybody else want to guess? You say four? Six minutes. It's six minutes. Okay. And so if you calculate them. So if you calculate the METs, which are, uh, is how you measure exercise, it's about three METs um, per minute. And so six minutes, it's about 18 calories, okay? You contrast that, sitting on the couch watching TV burns seven calories. So 18 <laughs> versus seven. All right? Physical activity and exercise promote weight loss maintenance. Fact or fiction? Fact, y'all think that's a fact? And this, incidentally, if you want to do some exercise, go over Wheeler Pass in Breckenridge. Push your bike up that thing for an hour. This is fact, okay? And so we'll talk about exercise and what role that plays in weight loss here in a little bit. And you see the little bullet point at the bottom, it's sufficient doses only. And most people in this room do not exercise in sufficient doses to not diet and only exercise. Maybe Tamara. But only recently. All right, so men can breastfeed, we all know that. Breastfeeding your child, according to Dr. Bienvenu, breastfeeding your child is a protective factor for future development of obesity. So you think it's important to breastfeed? Fiction, okay? There's no studies to show that, that's a myth. So the reason we're going through this is, to, is for everybody to understand that physicians have all these misconceptions. Breastfeeding, the baby actually learns, learns satiety better than the child that's bottle fed. Uh, I'm not sure. No, I know that. <laughs> now, I don't know about protecting it from obesity, but it's a satiety development. So you're talking about the kid developing obesity, yes. right? So, I'd have to look up the specific uh, source. I think this last one. So this is not the, the poster you want to put in your, I don't know if y'all can read that. You're fat, don't try and sugarcoat it because you'll eat that too. <laughs> so diet readiness. So a patient comes to your office and you assess how motivated they are because weight loss, is, there's a huge behavioral component. So assessing their motivation is important to, for success. What do y'all think? Is that fact or fiction? Fact? Y'all think that's fact? Fiction? Anybody? Fiction? Hillary says it's fact. That's fiction, okay? So, um, and the reason for that, they think one of the confounders for some of these studies is, are people that actually show up to the clinic, they have some degree of motivation, so that, that makes it hard to stratify, but um, degree of motivation is not linked to success in, in uh, the diet. All right, we're not gonna go into BMI, everybody knows BMI, just remember the underweight, normal, overweight, and obese. Uh, the computer pulls up, it tells you the BMI now. Uh, it's a screening tool only. Remember some of the drawbacks of uh, BMI. If you have a linebacker that plays for the Saints and misses tackles all the time, he's 6'4", weighs 240, he, by BMI, might be obese, okay? But uh, you have somebody that's 6'4", and not playing linebacker, and 240, they probably are obese, okay? And so you have to take all that to, into account. And there's some other ways to do that we'll talk about here in a minute. All right, we're not gonna get too much into this. Dr. Mighty went into this uh, at length uh, last week, but a third of US adults are obese. There's about 320 or something like that million people in the United States, so about 100 million obese people. So y'all can imagine it's only gonna get worse and it's gonna affect all of us and the cost of healthcare and all the, the issues that go along with that. What's even scarier is this right here. Two to 19 year olds, 17% are obese. And y'all see it, patients bringing their, their children up all the time. And this is, this is probably the biggest area of focus right now. And, uh, and so we're not gonna get into childhood obesity and, and, and treating children, we're all obese, and so that's kind of how it focuses talk. Racial differences, black and Hispanics are more likely to be obese than whites. Uh, lower socioeconomic uh, people are also uh, more prone to obesity. Everybody's seen the obesity map. I just put it up there again just to 
Mississippi, Louisiana, the heart of the South, that's where you know the, the bigger people are. All right, so now we're gonna talk about some medic medical complications of obesity, and uh, some of them y'all know, and some of them you don't think about on a, uh, when you see a patient coming into the clinic. And you know, one of the reasons for this talk, we all see these patients, we've all gotten used to 200 pounds is not big, you know, here at LSU, when you're gonna do a C-section or you have, most of the patients that come into the clinic are obese, they are, they are. And we do not, it's never in the diagnosis. I'm not saying we need to start putting in the, in the diagnosis. I don't know what the answer to all that is, but there's lots of things associated with that that we never counsel the patient or talk to the patient about. We do it in obstetrics, but definitely I know we're not doing it in GYN patients. I, we rarely have that conversation about losing weight. And uh, it's a conversation we need to have more often with our patients. So y'all can read up there. Some of the big ones are coronary artery disease, uh, some of the cancers, um, and then we all know the gynecologic issues associated with obesity. So we're gonna go into some in uh, just a little bit of detail. Um, so things that are directly related um, to obesity, coronary vascular disease, or lipids, hypertension, um, insulin, and uh, increased clotting, and these are some of the ones that are uh, associated. Stroke, this is kind of a scary statistic. Uh, obese people, for each point of the increase in their BMI, their risk goes up by six and four percent for these hemorrhagic and uh, ischemic stroke. These are all things to put in your mind too, so you have little talking points to tell your patients, and we'll talk about that here at the end of this section. Uh, obstructive sleep apnea, we had Dr. McCarty come talk to us, everybody. That was a real good talk. He talked about um, assessing a patient, looking at their palate. He talked about all the risk factors, and so we won't get into too much of that, but some of the major risk factors are upper body obesity, so you can just kind of look at a patient and assess that. Um, snoring and uh, snoring with apneic episodes is obviously the, the worst type. And then neck girth in men is 17 inches and women 16 inches. Uh, so those are the complications, those are sort of well known. Whenever I was a student, we didn't even talk about sleep. Sleep was never mentioned, we didn't, um, and the past 10 to 15 years, it seems like more and more research has come out and more and more things are, are being linked to uh, uh, sleep apnea and how important sleep is in, in general. We're not gonna go into this too much. This is pulled right off of up to date, uh, but these are the guidelines for metabolic syndrome. You can see uh, the reason I put this up here, there's five different criteria on this slide. So this is sort of something they really haven't, everybody has come together and, and come to the uh, conclusion, but basically it's insulin resistance, uh, alterations in uh, cholesterol, um, hypertension. So, um, and having uh, metabolic syndrome puts you at risk for all the things we already talked about. And obesity con contributes to that. Cancers, it's well known as gynecologist about endometrial cancer and breast cancer, but some of the ones you might not have known, colon, pancreas, gastric cardia, which is the greater curvature of the uh, stomach, uh, kidney and esophagus. Uh, I have this other bullet point cause is conjecture. Um, it's basically just seeing the association and in most cases we don't know the exact mechanism why it causes cancer. Endometrial cancer I think is real easy because of the, uh, the estrogen but the other ones it's not as well understood. Okay and so it's important to put these things in perspective. It's, it's important to put the, these things in perspective for you as a physician and for the patient. So when the patient comes in I talk about all these things. I talk about the risk of cancer. I talk about their blood pressure, I talk about all these things. You talk about their, you ask them if they have kids, if they have grandkids, and you try to put all these things and, and help motivate them to lose weight. And so you do it any way you can, and that's a big, uh, so I think it's important to have a discussion about the medical complications of obesity with the patient. And so now we're gonna talk about the rest of the story. And so if you heard Dr. Oz alluded to, kind of one of the mantras of weight loss is move more, eat less. And so um, that's true, and that's probably what you should tell the patient, but it's a whole lot more complicated than that. And basically whenever I try to explain that to a patient, what I do is uh, I just tell them that basically it's calories in, calories out, um, but their, their body's gonna work against them. So we were, Evolutionarily, we were made to reproduce and to thrive. And so, you know, back in when we were hunter and gatherers, we had all these these hormones and things that increased hunger and then increased the the want to, to get food. Now we have food at our fingertips, and so if you're hungry, you just go to Shannon's office and grab a Kit Kat or whatever. 
And so now those things are kind of working against us. And we'll, we'll kind of talk about some of those. But it's not quite that simple uh, as calories in, calories out. And so it's good to tell the patient that, because um, it's hard. And everybody, when they diet, if you've ever done a diet, you get really hungry and you, you have all these things that, are, that encourage you to eat. Okay, so we're not gonna go into the pathways in detail, but you can see there's two main pathways for hunger that feed onto the uh, central nervous system. There's the palm c cart pathway, which uh, decreases hunger, and there's the MPY-AR, uh, AGRP uh, pathway that uh, increases hunger. And the main one that works on this one is ghrelin, and we'll talk about ghrelin in detail here in a second. Uh, and then you have all these that feed into the, uh, the one that decreases hunger. Leptin, which is made in the fat, we'll talk about that, and uh, insulin. Insulin's really interesting. Centrally, uh, at the nervous system level, it acts to uh, decrease hunger, but peripherally, it causes uh, fat uptake, and so it increases uh, fat stores. So it kind of works both ways. So ghrelin is made in the gastric fundus. Uh, they don't know a whole lot about ghrelin. It's made in the gastric fundus, and it increases hunger. Um, it increases gut motility, get your gut rumbling, and studies, what they found is 30 or 40 minutes before a meal, you'll start having ghrelin release, and uh, that'll, that's why you start getting hungry. And it acts via the vagus, and one of the interesting things, we'll talk about a, some weight loss surgery techniques later, but this sleeve gastrectomy and some of the other techniques, actually when you excise this portion of the fundus where it's made, you don't have ghrelin made. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a side benefit of the surgery. So removing the, the fundus of the, sur, uh, the stomach and you don't have all the ghrelin release, so you, you take that hormone totally out of the picture. They didn't, find, they didn't know that when they designed the surgery. They found that out afterwards. CCK we won't get into, but just to show you all, duodenum, jejunum, short acting, uh, in, it, it uh, helps to decrease hunger. So does GLP-1, pancreas, um, Insulin and glucagon are the ones that we we're taught about in medical school most, but there's amylin and pancreatic polypeptide. All these uh, have various effects on hunger and satiety. So this isn't for y'all to memorize or, or even maybe learn about today. It's just to paint the picture that this is way more complicated than calories in and calories out. Unfortunately, I have to memorize all this for my test in December. The other big one that they found uh, by accident was leptin, and when they found leptin, it's made in the adipose tissue. They thought they had found this miracle hormone, and they were going to have all these miracle drugs to that were they were going to stamp out obesity. And uh, their hypothesis was that people that were really really obese uh, didn't have leptin; they had, had were deficient or they were um, uh, insensitive to it. And so they started testing the population, and there was only a very very uh, one in a thousand or one in 10,000 people have leptin de deficiency. It's really, really uh, rare. So what happens, the more adipose tissue you get, the more leptin you get, and this one actually works to help you. So um, the leptin feeds back on the pathway that we showed and decreases energy intake. So on the flip side, when you have somebody losing weight and they're losing fat mass, they're gonna get hungrier, okay? Because they're gonna have less leptin circulating in their body. So that's another, yet another thing working against patients whenever they're trying to lose weight. We got time. Okay, and so what was the point of all that? We kind of talked about that. It's not as simple as energy in, energy out. And I just wanted to kind of give you all the, the flavor of, of, of some of the other things uh, when you're counseling a patient or, or developing a diet plan. Some basic nutrition. This is right off of Wikipedia. Um, not really. Uh, carbs, fat, and protein. Uh, fat has seven grams of, uh, seven calories per gram, and the other two have four. So that's important to remember when you're recommending a diet, okay? That's why low-fat diets work. Low-fat diets work because seven kilocalories per gram. Um, these recommendations are hotly debated. The 10 to 35, 25 to 35, and 45 to 65 percent. The food pyramid that we've all seen since we were, you know, five years old going to school, a lot of people believe this is, th these are not right. And so the base of the food pyramid is carbs. And if you talk to some of these anti-carb people that do all this uh, research, uh, like this guy Ludwig up in Boston, they are, they think that the food pyramid should be like shredded and redone and um, that carbs are really bad. And, but if you look, 45 to 65% of our diet is, is what the recommendations are should be from carbohydrates. And that's okay in some patients, and in some patients, 
are prone with certain body types with central obesity and things, um, carbs are going to affect them differently. And so you have to kind of think about all this when you're developing a plan. Fiber we never talk about, um, and that's really important to talk about with the patient. It has a lot of benefits, uh, like decreasing the risk of colon cancer. But it's also going to make them feel full, uh, fuller and uh, help with their gut motility and all that kind of stuff. So recommendations are 38 to 25. If they're doing a food diary on any of the apps, it'll tell you the fiber. It'll, it'll automatic, automatically calculate. So if the patient comes in and they're not eating enough fiber, you should definitely counsel them to do that. And if they're not getting it through their diet, then they, should, they can take a supplement. Anybody know what foods are high in fi high, highest in fiber per, by weight? What? Beans is probably one of the highest by weight. And so, yeah, fruits and vegetables with the, with the skin on and things like that. So, and things uh, that you thought were high in, fi uh, high in fiber maybe aren't. So it's good to, to look before we start counseling the patient. Not going to go into detail about this. These are the recommended micronutrients. This is important. I highlighted some that are important to our profession. So that takes us to patient assessment. This is the most important part of the whole talk. Um, so if you want to do run a diet clinic or you want to do this, first off, I would not suggest it's very difficult to get reimbursed for this. So this is not something a patient comes in for an annual exam and you're going to do diet counseling. It takes too long. It takes, I don't know, what's it take y'all to do? 45 minutes? to do a good counseling with a patient. It takes about 45 minutes. And so, and if they come back and you try to bill it through insurance, you're probably not gonna get paid. So most of these things are cash. And so this is a good thing for y'all to think about if y'all, when y'all get out, if y'all wanna do this, if you do it in the right way, you're not gonna get, uh, you're not gonna get in trouble or your license suspended or uh, anything like that. You have to, there's some few things that you need to do and we'll talk about those. Uh, but this, this can increase the income in your practice, okay? especially for all you guys that are going out and not gonna have a bunch of patients right at first, or maybe ever, uh, <laughs> because they just like to see the females, unfortunately, for us. And so this is maybe one way you can supplement your income, okay? Um, so you have got to document the past medical history, because um, this is all gonna feed into diet pills here in a minute. We're gonna talk about uh, weight loss medication, because that's what, that's what brings the patient in the door. They want the medication. Then we have the opportunity to go through all these things and counsel them and educate them. And, uh, but what gets them in the door is they want a pill. Everybody wants a quick fix. Um, so these are the things you have to document. You have to document past medical history. We talked about that at length a minute ago, all the reasons why that's important. You have to document it also because there's some contraindications to some of the medications and you don't want to be given a patient uh, Adipex and they have some kind of arrhythmia and they have an issue. It's, it's unacceptable, you know, that's unforgivable. Uh, family history, we talked about uh, all the comorbid conditions they run in families, hypertension, diabetes, all those things, but also um, people that uh, have obese parents or uh, have double the risk to be obese themselves. And they don't know if that's genetics, I'm sure it's a little bit of, of both nurture and nature. And so it's good to ask, you know, are you the biggest in your family or the skinniest in your family? How's everybody else in your family? You'll, You'll talk to a lot of people and they're like, everybody's big in my family. Everybody weighs 300 pounds or, and uh, so anyway, then that's, a, that's another piece of information that's helpful. There's a lot of conflicting data on sleep. Um, what expert opinion is right now is probably six to eight hours. More than eight hours is bad for, for weight loss and uh, less than six hours is bad. So if you're not in that sort of that sweet spot, then you're, you're working against yourself too as far as uh, weight gain and loss. Medication history, this is something we never, and I, I frankly didn't do it until I went to one of these conferences. There are lots of medications that promote weight loss and lots that, that uh, I guess are the cannabis, is that what you're giggling about? <laughs> so you wanna ask them uh, about the medications. Uh, SSRIs tend to be uh, uh, increased weight gain, some seizure medications, antihistamines, which a lot of patients are on Zyrtec daily and all this, that can, uh, hurt too. Beta blockers of tenolol uh, specifically uh, can decrease uh, their chances of losing weight. Uh, and also if they exercise and you're putting them on a tenolol, that's bad too because it's going to decrease exercise tolerance. So it might be better to find a different drug. Some diabetes drugs, cannabis, depo we all know, and steroids. OCPs have not been shown uh, to increase weight. It's conflictual. There's no, I don't think you can say either way. These are the ones that are 
that have pretty good data. And then there's some things that they're on that uh, decrease weight. Uh, Ritalin and the ADH medications all do. And of course, social drugs like cocaine, meth. Um, Topamax, if you have a patient on Topamax, that, that decreases uh, decreases weight, and actually one of the new weight loss drugs uses Topamax and Adapex in combination. Uh, and it works very, very well. Wellbutrin, uh, metformin. Metformin is commonly used as a weight loss medication, so a lot of the, the clinics actually prescribe metformin before they do uh, some of the other drugs. At a certain point, it, it's going to be like anything. You know, what we talked about the 100, 100 walk a mile, 100 calories, so it's going to be sort of that. Yeah, probably initially they'll lose weight, but it, yeah. So. Because you got to remember, as you lose weight too, you need less calories, and so all these things are working together. So if you have a small benefit from a drug, and these, these aren't great, like Topamax or something, it's not, it's not going to be, they're not going to lose 15 pounds on Topamax. It's going to only be, in the studies, it's two or three kilograms. So. Okay, and then obviously social history is important when you're talking about marijuana and meth and all these other things. Uh, weight history. Weight history is very important. And if you look at most weight, and uh, a lot of physicians will plot it out. They'll say, how, you know, when you were 18, what did you weigh in high school? What did you weigh at the end of college? What did you weigh 25, 30? And you'll see these charts, and they kind of they go up and down, up and down, and they, they eventually end up a lot higher. Exactly. And uh, so it's really important to do that so when you're talking about goals because a lot of people, they come in the office and they're 300 pounds and I'm like, when had, when's the last time you've been 200 pounds? Oh, that's been 20 years ago or 10 years ago. So it's important to, to, to talk to the patient about that because when you start talking about weight loss, we're talking about half a pound to two pounds a week is generally what you get from cutting calories. So you have to impress on them that they're not going to lose 100 pounds in six months or three months. It might take a year or two years. And so they didn't get to 300 pounds in you know, six months, and they're not going to get to 200 pounds in six months. Physical activity we're going to get into in a second. Diet attempts, weird. Uh, it's very important. You have to document that they have tried diets to write diet pills. So you got to make sure that's in the medical record. Um, and it's just important. You don't want to tell somebody to do Weight Watchers and they've done Weight Watchers and they hate it and they didn't lose any weight. So it's very important to ask them what they've done, assess that, and then develop an individualized plan for that patient. Physical exam, uh, height, weight, obviously. Some people do waist circumference, hip, hip to waist. There's some good data for that. I don't do that. Neck circumference, I don't do that. Uh, and then there's body composition. There, there's machines that are about ten to $20,000 that will tell you how much fat mass and how much uh, lean muscle mass you have. And they're actually really good tools because um, people will plateau, people will lose weight and you'll see they'll get smaller, you know, their clothes will fit better and this is one way to, to do that, to show them that. And it'll tell you down to the detail like how much uh, lean muscle mass you have in your right arm, your left arm, your abdomen and your feet and basically it does this through uh, uh, these contact points. You have to step on the scale uh, barefoot and it runs a current through your hands and through your feet. It measures the, the water content and all this. All right, the other thing when a patient comes in is to, to sort of uh, estimate their caloric requirements. You can do this a number of different ways. The quick and easy way to do it is 22 to 25 kilocalories to maintain one kilogram of body weight. So you just change them over to kilograms and then you multiply by 22 and 25 and you can tell them how many calories they're eating a day to maintain the current body weight. That is really important. When you take a patient that weighs 250 pounds and you calculate this out, it's like 3,000 calories. And when you tell somebody they're eating 3,000 calories a day, they will say, no, they're not. And then which brings you to the next thing that we talked, was on the last slide, was the, the food recall. And then that's when you start asking them, what did you eat? Well, I went to Chili's last night. What did you have at Chili's? Well, I got the, I ate healthy. I got the, you know, I got this, this, and this. I was like, okay. Do you know how many calories in that? And you'll add it up for them, it'll be like 1,200 calories they ate at Chili's. They had no idea. And so these people are eating 3,000 calories a day. And so it's really, really important to do this. It's also important to show them when they lose weight how they're gonna need less calories. So a lot of times I'll say, you're eating 3,000 calories an hour. We're gonna change you to 1,800 calories for your diet. But in six months, if you lose 50 pounds, we're gonna have to go down on that even more. And uh, 
So we'll skip that. So let's talk about some diets real quick. Um, there are lots of diets out there and there's lots of research on all the diets and they pretty much all say the same thing. All diets are good. The key is to find out which diet works for which patient. So if somebody tells you low carb is the best or low fat or ornish or any of this, that is simply not true, okay? The best diet is what works for the patient. And um, so this is right out of uh, one of the journals and this is what all weight loss studies look like. You have this huge initial dip and then you have all of them look like this. I mean, verbatim. But if you look at this one, uh, low carb and Mediterranean, we're a little bit better than low fat, and you can find studies that show that low fat's better. Um, you can find all kinds of studies to show whatever you want, but basically they're all pretty similar. And if you look, it's negative three, negative five, this is kilograms. There's only about a one and a half kilo difference in these two diets, okay? That's like four pounds or something like that, so it's not really that significant. It's just important. Any diet is gonna, that restricts calories is gonna work, period. So when you talk to the patient also, this is um, evidence-based guidance here too. Uh, these lower BMIs, they're gonna, you're hoping for a half pound to a pound a week by cutting the calories through the five, three to 500, and then the bigger patients, you cut them by 500 to 1,000, they're gonna lose one to two pounds a week, okay? So what I tell the patients, if you're not losing one to two pounds a week, you're doing something wrong, okay? You need to reevaluate your food diary, you need to come back in, but they should lose weight once a week. Okay, for them to know they're losing weight, they need to weigh. And there's good evidence to show that weighing weekly or on a, uh, some people weigh daily, but weighing on a regular basis also maintains weight. And so that's a, a really important thing to counsel patients on. This is out of September, uh, New England Journal of Medicine. They did a big uh, meta-analysis, same thing I just told you. Um, all diets are, are pretty similar. One interesting thing about how they do all these diet studies, they're really flawed just from the get-go. All diet studies are done by phone recall. There's only been one study where they actually knew exactly what the patients ate, and that was in Israel at a, uh, at a, at a factory or something, and they fed, the, they fed the workers breakfast and lunch, so they knew exactly what the workers were getting. And then they recommended what they ate at dinner, and they did food recall on that. So that's probably the best study as far as the only other way to do it is lock somebody. Y'all go to LSU? Anybody go to LSU? Well, all y'all did. Y'all remember the Pennington research? They'd always want study participants. You could go for like the whole weekend. They'd lock you in a metabolic chamber and feed you and exercise you, and they'd measure the changes in temperature and measure like to the T, like caloric. And that's the only way to really do a study. All these studies are based on recall. So basically, if you want to do a study, and I'm going to compare the James Barrow tongue patch diet to, uh, to uh, Atkins, then You'd have a nurse call once a week and tell me, tell me what you ate. How many people can recall what they ate over the past week? I can't. And then the nurse sits down and writes it all down. And this is the data they use to compare these studies. So you can imagine with that being said that there's, there's not a whole lot of difference. Okay, so let's talk about exercise real quick. I'll just hit the high points here. Exercise alone to lose weight is almost impossible for most normal people that are busy. Um, you need to burn up to 2,000 kilocalories a week to uh, lose weight. Does anybody know how much exercise that is? That's like two hours a day, seven days a week of moderate to vigorous exercise. So when you talk about exercise, you also have to talk about the intensity. So does anybody know what moderate to vigorous is? So moderate to vigorous is like when Tamara climbed up the stairs, the one flight of stairs, and she can't talk, and she's in the food line trying to catch her breath, okay? That's moderate to vigorous, okay? So jogging, running. Uh, so when you have a patient and they're, they're, they say they walk or do something, you, you have to ask them about the intensity of the exercises. If they're just going out and walking and they can have a, a normal conversation, like I've seen people at the, at the track and they're like talking on their cell phones as they're walking around the track, that's not gonna do anything, okay? That's not gonna burn a whole lot of calories. Um, and so if you want to not diet and exercise, you gotta burn up to 2,000 calories a week and you gotta put that in perspective for the patient. So what I recommend is, is uh, exercise is an adjunct to weight loss and it works really well when it's just an adjunct. So to lose weight, they need to cut calories and adding on the exercise um, will help. Another important thing about exercise 
is when you start losing a bunch of weight, especially if you do like an Atkins diet and you go into ketosis, you start breaking down lean uh, body mass. So doing weight bearing exercise and strength training in general will help protect your lean muscle mass. And so you want to try to do that too. Because when you get Dr. Groom's age, you can't make any more lean muscle mass. You only can lose it. So it's about after age 50, everybody starts losing lean muscle mass. So you got to, the only way to protect that is to do um, weight bearing exercise. All right, so we talked about what moderate and vigorous is. There's some examples, aerobic walking, running. I think dancing is in here, so that's good for Jody. Uh, square dancing, there it is, right there. That's only moderate, Jody, only moderate. So. But square dancing energetically is vigorous. And then, you know, another thing to tell your partner to, to motivate them to clean the house, scrubbing the floor, moderate, that's moderate exercise. So when Tamara Tamar makes Brian do all the, the housework while she's at, at work, he, she can uh, use that to help. All right, so you can look these up. These are all on the internet, and you can tell patients what type of exercise burns what type of calories. Behavioral, very, very important, as I've talked about um, a bunch during the talk. Uh, behavioral alone, you can get a 7 to 10% weight loss over six months, uh, but with behavioral, uh, some things are important. It has to be regular. Uh, the longer you do it, the, the less effective it is. Uh, group counseling, things like Weight Watchers work really well. Uh, if they don't just do the points, if they go to the meetings. Um, some centers actually have weekly meetings for their weight loss patients. And if you combine this with the other things, it works really, really, really well. So we're kind of wrapping up here. Surgical uh, weight loss approaches. I did not, I never knew what these things meant when I heard them. Um, but there's a Roux and Y, there's a uh, gastric banding and gastric sleeve. This was the most popular pro probably back in the 90s. Has anybody ever been in an abdomen and seen one of these things? Yeah, we did, I did too. I was at Conway and we, did a, we were doing a hysterectomy on this lady and it was totally, it was just floating around in the peritoneal cavity. And so um, anyway, this is what it is. Gastric banding basically, all it is is restrictive. And this little port, uh, you can blow the port up or shrink it and control how big the uh, stomach is, basically. The bad thing about gastric banding is you don't get all the hormonal effects. It's just restrictive. Ruin Y procedure, um, the stomach's actually not removed, but a small pouch is made and it's bypassed. And so they bypass like a large portion of the uh, small intestine and all of the stomach, basically. So this procedure is restrictive because you get this tiny little pouch right here, but you get all the hormonal benefits, all the ones that, uh, uh, some of the things I, I talked about earlier. This is, these are probably the two most popular, but this is the, the most popular procedure now, and it's called a gastric sleeve. And basically, it's really easy to do, too. They just take one of these stapling devices and they staple down and take out the greater curvature of the stomach, okay? And so we talked about earlier with the ghrelin and all that is released, is gone. And it's basically restrictive with a little bit of uh, metabolic effects as well. These procedures are only indicated for people with a BMI above 40 or 35 and risk factors. Um, so obstructive sleep apnea, severe hypertension, things like that. So I think we forget to think about these, uh, these options and these are really, really, really good options. Weight loss surgery is the most effective way, uh, way to lose weight. And it's the most effective way to decrease your patient's risk of death and all these things. And so we should not forget that, um, especially if they fail diet attempts. And a lot of insurances pay for it. So this is, this is a really, it's a, it's a really good thing. Is it by, Medicaid? by Medicaid? Probably not. I don't think so. I'm not sure though. And so medication, the things that are important to remember about medication, it's an adjunct, okay? So you can do all these diets and they're gonna lose weight. But if you do diet with a medication, they're gonna lose more weight. You have to document several things in the chart. You have to indicate failed diet attempts. Um, they can only be on the met medication for three to six months uh, for Adipex uh, or the stimulants. Their BMI has to be greater than 30 or 27 with the risk factors, okay? So, you know, these women that come in the clinic are just overweight or they call, don't see those patients, don't give them Adipex, don't do that. That's how you will get your license suspended, okay? And several physicians in town did get their license suspended with the uh, Louisiana board for diet pills. And you just have to be really careful about these things. The 
literature shows that uh, fenteramine, which is Adipex, is not addictive. They've had people that took it for 20 years and they take them off and it's shown no addictive properties. It's gotten really a bad rap because of some of the earlier generation medicines, uh, but the DEA, it's a schedule four, I think, and so you have to follow the rules, okay? So you have to be real careful. Uh, so if anybody decides to do this later and they want to run a diet clinic, I put, and you do it in Louisiana, the laws, they're right there. You can look them up. It tells you what you need to stay out of trouble. It's very straightforward. You do all the things I talked about. See the patient yourself. Document that you saw the patient. Document that you counseled them on diet and exercise. Document that they tried to lose weight in the past. Document that their, their BMI is greater than 30. All these things. Where you're going to get in trouble is you have somebody else running your diet clinic and they come in and they watch a video. This is watch a video and then they, you know, all these things. So you have to just be really careful. They, they, they like to crack down on, on this. Do not call in prescriptions, give them paper prescriptions. You have to see the patient monthly and you have to document their weight and their blood pressure and you have to have a note in the chart. And that you can have a, a, a mid level provider do. So in our clinic, Hillary does that. So they see the patient back, she checks their food diary, she documents that they brought their food diary in. She documents their weight loss or lack of weight loss and their blood pressure and all those things, okay? If you have a patient that's not losing weight, don't keep writing them out See them again, okay? In our clinic, that would mean they'd have to do like a restart or initial where they have to come back in and get counseling. That's more expensive, but do not keep writing the drugs if they're not losing weight. And then you also have to uh, put that you uh, recommend a diet and exercise. And so basically what we did, Tamara just made a, a smart phrase and we have all the elements we need in our note and we go through and make sure we address all those. So you can do that too. These are the drugs that are currently approved. Uh, there are more in uh, FDA trials. Adipex is what I use. The reason we use Adipex is it costs 20 bucks, okay? Kismia, which I talked about earlier, which is pentyramine and uh, Topamax. $200 a month, Belvique is about $200 a month, and then Ally and Zenical are over the counter, okay? Does anybody know why Ally or Zenical are not more heavily used? One third of patients experience severe what? Yes, just says GI side effects, including anal leakage, <laughs> sharding, all those type of things, okay? so. Most patients do not like that. It's only about a third of patients, and if you're going to recommend that somebody take this, you better you better tell them what to expect. <laughs> because I, I'm serious, they, they will be upset. Belvique is a is a new drug. It's Locaserin, and uh, it's uh, it targets some of the pathways we were talking about. It's not a stimulant, and so this one you can actually it's not as uh, regulated as this. Probably not, probably just use one drug at a time. You can use, if you're gonna do that, I'll, I'll put them like on metformin and then one of these things. But again, most people, even paying patients, are gonna come see you, they're gonna pay cash for the visit and then you're gonna have to, uh, you're gonna write them a $200 drug, they're not, they're not gonna do that. And so all these drugs in, uh, in comparison studies, they all have, it's kind of the same thing as a diet. They all are within a pound to three pounds difference. And so that's why, uh, like Adipex. They may only get three pound less weight loss, but it costs 20 bucks. So, and the side effect profile is very, very low. All right, and so just to sum it up, yeah, I think that's it. Keep it simple for the patient. The patient's gonna come in, you're gonna do a 45 minute sit down with them and tell them all these things they never heard of about exercise, about nutrition, about diet, all these things. You wanna have some take home key points that they can understand and, and leave the office. Sort of like if you have a patient come in and they have an abnormal pap and then when they leave they think they have you know, cervical cancer. You don't want to do that. So keep it very, very simple for the patient. Assess their knowledge level, their background, how much they understand and, and keep it very simple. And this, the way to keep it very simple is to say calories in, calories out. And uh, that's it. Any questions? I gotta wait 10 seconds. <laughs> if they're not losing weight, they'll continue the medication. Like how long on Adipex do you give them? Like two months? No. If they, if they come in and they don't lose weight and they come back in the next time and they have not lost weight again, we stop the medication and restart from scratch. Like how often are you seeing them? We see them once a month. No, how often are you seeing them?
Not very often. Most people lose weight. If they do the food diary, they will lose weight, bottom line. Food diary is very powerful. Yes? So I always recommend whatever works best. So, you know, if the patient comes in and they're not good on their phone or whatever, then they can just write it down. Really, the one of the things that works the best is to put a patient, tell them to go to, uh, what am I thinking of? The Weight Watchers, I'm sorry. So Weight Watchers. Uh, weight Watchers and Nutrisystem are the only, only uh, weight loss programs that have uh, data to support their efficacy. And so if you don't think they're going to be good with a phone or counting their calories outright, then send them to Weight Watchers. Weight Watchers, it works. So I want to patient with weight and then should them? Yeah, if a patient with PCOS came in, I would put them on metformin. And then you could, you could try that at first, or you could add Adipex or Kismi or any of the drugs, and that would be a, a really good approach. And remember also to tell your patients, 10% weight loss decreases, decreases uh, all these uh, morbidities. So it's going to decrease blood pressure, decrease everything. And so that's what you want to kind of aim for at first. 10 to 15% weight loss is considered a good response to any weight loss program. Birth control, yeah, because they get pregnant when they start ovulating. Yes. And that is one thing too, if you're writing medication, you need to do it, you need to make sure they're on some, we document in the chart, they have their tube style or they're on birth control or whatever, because they can't take these medications, a lot of them, and be pregnant. That's a very good point. And yes, they will ovulate when they lose weight. Yes? Um, I feel like it's so whenever you decide, you stop them after they've been on that for like six months? Yes. And because you have to, basically. That's what the FDA says we have to do with the medication. Three to six months is all that's allowed. And so then they come off the program, and hopefully by then, from doing their food diary, and, and it's helped. I had a patient, she was on last year, she lost 40 pounds, she came back to me. She hadn't been in like six months, Hillary, or a year. Yep. Stopped that effects, maintained her weight loss, she's still down 40 pounds when she came yesterday. And she wants to get back and do another round of intense dieting and, and weight loss and lose like another six. And so, so six Tater. Ever? What's that? No. You can that's, do six months and then. That's what he said. He's yeah. just doing it again. We'll yeah. Round There's no guideline on when you can restart, whether it's two months or three months or a year Wait, or six months. Yeah. <laughs> Probably if you do that, you end up in the board letter. <laughs> in the bulletin. Yeah, because. On the front of the website, too. I mean, a patient comes in at 300 pounds or something, six months, they're not going to be down yeah. significantly. And so that's when you can use other things like metformin. You can use, you can, um, the, uh, Ally over the counter and all that kind of stuff, but uh, CrossFit. That, yeah. So, anything else? All right. Very good. Thank you all.